Showery for South Wales and cloudy at times as bands of showers move in from the southwest. Turning windy with temperatures between 7 and 9 Celsius. Birmingham and the West Midlands are likely to see a band of heavy showers move eastwards across the region through the evening. It will turn rather breezy with temperatures of around 6 or 7 Celsius. And it's a similar story for North East England, where a band of showers, heavy at times, will move eastwards across the region through the evening, turning breezy with temperatures of around 7 or 8 Celsius. Southern Scotland will also see a few showers through the evening time, with some clearer spells in between. And a light moderate southwesterly breeze and temperatures of between 5 and 7 Celsius. A moderate fresh southwesterly breeze for Northern Ireland through the evening with areas of cloud, a scattering of showers and some clear spells. Temperatures of 6 or 7 Celsius. Low pressure will continue to dominate the UK's weather overnight, bringing gales to the far northwest and further scattered showers. And that's how the weather's shaping up. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Good evening everyone, you're watching Neil Oliver live on GB News TV and on radio. Tonight on the programme we'll be discussing the UK Health Security Agency advice for people who are ill to resume wearing face masks. We'll be assessing Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's education plans, including his eye-catching idea for pupils to study maths until they turn 18. Thought of it turns my blood cold. This is uh, this week's Great Britain is Simon Lee, who has helped hundreds of young people to overcome anxiety and other issues. Plus, plenty of chat with my brilliant panel, Julie Cook and Tonya Buxton. All of that and more coming up. But first, an update on the latest news from Aaron Armstrong. Hi there, it is a minute past six. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom. Downing Street have described today's discussions between NHS leaders and the Prime Minister as highly valuable. Rishi Sunak reiterated his commitment to provide £14 billion of additional funding for the health service and says the next steps will be set out shortly. The Prime Minister hosted the crisis talks with health experts at number 10 in an effort to ease the pressure on the NHS. The chief executive of the Day Lewis Pharmacy Group, Jay Patel, says the talks were constructive. You know, the session was a, it was a small group of us, um, lots of insight in terms of what the problems really are out there, balance between community pharmacy and general practice, and some great description of what the core issues are out there on the ground. 
the PM was very receptive to what we discussed and, and we explained the issues and we swiftly moved on to looking at options that we could put into place to be able to rapidly see if we can alleviate some of those challenges. However, Shadow Public Health Minister Andrew Gwynne says further reforms are needed to fix the NHS crisis. Everybody who has an interest in the National Health Service really should be round the table, trying to work out not only the short term measures that are needed to get us through the rest of this winter, but also how we then put health and social care on a sustainable footing, the kind of reforms that are needed, the kind of investment that's needed for the long term, not just sticking plasters. Shelling in Ukraine. Shelling is continuing in Ukraine despite Russia's proposed 36-hour ceasefire. Missile strikes have been heard in the eastern city of Bakhmut, as one resident described the situation there. Our town used to be so beautiful. There were roses everywhere, flowers. It was clean. Everything was kept in order. Russia declared its forces would observe a unilateral ceasefire for Orthodox Christmas, which was immediately dismissed by Kyiv as propaganda and a cynical trap. The Kremlin claims its troops have only fired in retaliation to attacks from Ukrainian forces. The Foreign Secretary has condemned Iran's execution of two demonstrators, James Cleverly, called the hangings abhorrent and has urged the country to immediately end the violence against its own people. Iran executed the two men for allegedly killing a member of its security forces during nationwide protests following the death of the 22-year-old Kurdish-Iranian woman, Masa Amini, last September. Police in the United States have arrested a six-year-old boy after he shot and seriously injured a teacher at a primary school in the state of Virginia. Officers say the woman's injuries were initially thought to be life-threatening, but her condition has improved in hospital. The chief police officer uh, says the shooting was not accidental and that the two had what has been described as an altercation. It is unclear how the child got hold of the handgun. The RMT says rail companies at the heart of the long-running dispute over pay made hundreds of millions of pounds in profits. The union claims that big sums of money were generated when government awarded uh, private operators new contracts during the pandemic. They say companies made up to £310 million in taxpayer-funded profits between March 2020 and September 2022. It comes as the RMT and 14 rail operators continue their 48-hour walkout, overpay jobs and conditions. And MPs have been urged to support paid leave for miscarriage. The proposal by an SNP member would grant three days of statutory paid leave to parents who experience a miscarriage before 24 weeks of pregnancy. Angela Crawley says it would give parents the time they need to grieve. Currently, paid bereavement leave is only given followed stillbirth after 24 weeks. Prince Harry claims he was not the real best man at the wedding of his brother, the Prince of Wales. In more leak excerpts from the memoir, the Duke of Sussex reportedly says the role was fulfilled by his brother's two closest friends. He's also suggested King Charles feared Meghan would dominate the monarchy and steal the limelight from Charles and Camilla. Referring back to his military days, Harry says he killed 25 Taliban fighters, a claim which has been criticised by both the British Army and the Taliban. Finally, flood warnings are in place across England and Wales as heavy downpours are set to hit the UK overnight. There are 27 flood warnings in place for England, with eight warnings in place for Wales. The Scottish Environment Protection Agency has also issued six flood alerts for Scotland. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it is back to Neil Oliver Live. Thanks, Aaron. While reading around the subject of Russia and Ukraine this week, I came across the story of the Potemkin villages. A legend, dismissed as mostly fiction by modern historians, has 18th century Russian statesman Grigory Potemkin building phony villages along the banks of the Dnipro River just for effect, to create a useful illusion. 
His lover, Catherine the Great, and her foreign guests were due to sail down the river on a tour, and Potemkin, the story goes, wanted to give them an impressive show of a populous and thriving nation. As I say, the idea is largely dismissed now, but the term Potemkin village has stuck and is still used today to describe the lengths to which the leaders of a failing, broken country might go to in order to create the illusion of success and prosperity when the truth is altogether different. I read about the idea and it occurs to me that here in Britain now we're actually living in a Potemkin village, invited by our leaders to populate a phony facade and pretend, or God help us, actually believe as if everything is fine, but nothing is fine. The fact is the story they're telling us about this country of ours is almost entirely a con trick, a pers persuasive only if you don't look too closely at the flimsy plasterboard truth of their creation. When it came to Potemkin villages, real or a myth, it was only outsiders who were to be fooled. They were just passing through after all. The crucial difference for us Brits is that the fakery all around us is not supposed to trick the tourists. Its most important function is to try and convince us, the tax-paying citizens, that all is well, when it most emphatically is not. Look at this poor old place and wonder at how much fakery has been erected. And remember all the time that we're also taxed right up the wazoo for our continued occupation of the shoddy reality some of us see around us. There's so much wrong it's hard to know where to begin. Year after year we hemorrhage more and more cash into a national health service that isn't which is to say, it isn't a national health service. Free at the point of delivery is all very well, but it means nothing if you can't get yourself to that point of delivery while you've still got a pulse. Quite simply, the sacred cow come white elephant that is or has been the NHS is demonstrably incapable of doing the job intended for it. Infuriatingly, politicians of every stripe insist on calling it our NHS, as though it were a beloved family member, but it's not. That use of our is simply to deter us from ever criticising it. Waiting lists grow ever longer. Sick and injured people wait in agony and desperation for ambulances that don't come or not for many hours. We're actually told not to bother the NHS, to do all we can to avoid needing the service we pay for. And so trusting people obey, suffering in silence in their homes, not reporting their health concerns to their GPs, the lumps, the stubborn coughs, the blood, putting off the call for help that might save their lives until it's too late. But the NHS is only one part, admittedly a hugely expensive part, of this land of make-believe. We're no longer policed by consent, rather the police force, and it is a force now in lieu of a service, has been bent around political or ideological will. Some protest groups are deemed good, just stop oil, extinction rebellion, insulate Britain, Black Lives Matter, and fed tea and biscuits while they block the roads and smash windows protected from any and all opposing views. Others espousing opinions that fly in the face of the latest ideological kink or political diktat, protests about so-called vaccines or about lockdowns or illegal immigration, often prompt the unleashing of the men on horseback, the riot shields. Crimes without violence are effectively decriminalised now. Blind eyes and deaf ears are turned to burglary, to break-ins to cars, to broad daylight theft from shops and businesses and the like. Under-resourced and overworked forces haven't the capacity for investigating any but the most appalling crimes. Even then, it's a lottery in which most of the tickets are losers. A woman has something like a 1 in 77 chance of seeing her rapist convicted. It's increasingly true to say that crime has no consequences in this country. Help yourself, do what you feel like. And if you do have the astonishing bad luck to actually get arrested, why not just self-identify as innocent? The safest line to take if you want to get on in this Potemkin village of ours is that men are women if they say they are. Almost without exception, our most senior politicians are unable or at least absolutely unwilling to say what a woman actually is. If we're not safe to say that a woman is an adult human female, what kind of reality are we living in anyway? Even some of the shapes moving around in our Potemkin village are just characters in borrowed costumes. The Palace of Westminster is yet another fake structure within the Potemkin village, a facade with nothing of meaningful substance behind it. Parliament's a joke, pure and simple. Bad enough that for generations the House of Commons has been dominated and therefore utterly compromised by the party system. Now those parties might as well be one. Vote Conservative, vote Labour, vote Liberal, it makes no difference. There is but one ideology now, the ideology of control, of telling us the little people when to jump and how high. Everywhere you look, truth has been replaced by falsehood, fakery and lies, fake news for a fake village. 
mountains of data reveal that the products marketed as vaccines are no such thing. They don't stop infection. They don't stop transmission. They don't stop an infected person getting sick. They don't keep an infected person out of hospital. And they don't stop an infected person dying. By any measure, those products released under emergency use authorization and demonstrably the cause of countless deaths and injuries are at best a facade, a front, an optical illusion intended to make the masses move in the direction desired by the leaders. Whatever way you cut it, those products don't work as advertised. And yet still the advertising slash propaganda campaigns are up and running right now this very minute, pushing needles into as many arms as possible, including those of healthy six-month-old babies. Talking heads still trumpet the nonsense that the vaccine rollout was an unqualified success. Stuffed shirts that stood at the forefront of the pandemic, pushing the medical products, pushing the lockdowns, pushing the face masks, were honoured for their efforts then and remain honoured now, even as the data makes it increasingly plain, to me at least, that what was inflicted upon our population was an unforgivable wrong. Fake knights of the realm for our Potemkin village. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, elected by none of us and therefore a fake Prime Minister, has promised to halt the flow of illegal migrants onto British shores. But I say he'll do no such thing. In fact, I say he doesn't even have any intention of stopping that flow. Any and every British government promises to protect our borders. This is now a fake promise with nothing behind it. Our landscapes are littered with wind turbines and yet millions can barely afford to heat their homes because one way or another, we aren't allowed access to the most obvious and reliable sources of energy. Drax power station used to burn coal. Now it burns wood pellets obtained by cutting down ancient forests in Canada that campaigners there say are vital for fighting climate change. By banning coal and burning ancient forests, Drax is considered green and so in recent years has received £6 billion in government subsidies. Drax now emits more greenhouse gases than when it burned coal. Drax might be held up as the epitome of the fakery of the misnamed Green Agenda. The Green Agenda is not about green, rather it's about greed. There's even fake meat and fake milk and fake cheese and scores of other fake products besides. What else would you serve in a Potemkin village after all but fake food? Most of the media is pushing the fake agenda entirely appropriate in a Potemkin village. As we speak, they're ramping up the same old fear about COVID, that illness with the threat risk now to most of the common cold, the same determination to ignore everything we've learned over the last three years. Actors on stage wear masks, and so must we. While more and more of the population wakes up to the lies, obfuscation, fear porn and propaganda around the so-called vaccines, around the green agenda, around gender politics and race politics, the majority of the news media obediently pumps out the same old tosh about safe and effective and climate crisis and preferred pronouns and race baiting. But the fakery has been swiftly and shoddily constructed without the foundation of truth. For that reason, this Potemkin village thrown up around us is flimsy and should be easily demolished if we wish it so. Underneath it all, too quiet for too long, we know the truth of Britain. More of us comprehend every day that beyond a shadow of a doubt our leaders have tried to hoodwink us into believing things that are simply not true. The ultimate Potemkin village is all lies, no truth. The eye-wateringly expensive NHS, costs rising year on year, is no longer a health service for all in any way that matters. I say the green agenda is a fraud, as is the climate crisis that underpins it. The assertion that little boys can grow up to be women and that little girls can grow up to be men are lies that our government means to protect our borders is a fiction. A parliament in which overmighty, colluding, indistinguishable political parties dictate the law to the people, whether those people like it or not, is a shameful setting aside of the sovereignty of we the people of this country. Parliament is not and was never meant to be sovereign. We the people are sovereign. This is the foundation stone of Magna Carta, sealed in 1215 and as unshakably solid now as it was then. Any attempt to reduce the rights, freedoms and liberties enshrined in that treaty are by definition beyond the power of any parliament. Here's the thing, our sovereignty of, as people was sealed by that treaty of 1215. Parliaments have come and tried to ride roughshod over the people again and again, and those parliaments have gone. One of many attempts to repeal Magna Carta was even made in 1969, while the general public were conveniently distracted by the moon landings. I've said it before and I'll say it again, we see them. We see the fakery that they have raised around us. But our rights are real. Our belief in Britain is real. Isn't it time to see past the shaky stage set thrown up around us as a distraction 
and to take shelter instead in true Britain, real Britain. All of that is my opinion, of course, and you're free to disagree. Keep your tweets and emails coming all through the show. You can email gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can tweet me as well, at gbnews, and I'll try to get to your comments later in the show. Let's meet my panel, author and journalist Julie Cook, and the broadcaster and restaurateur Tonya Buxton. What do you think, Tonya? Um, Will the MPs ever bother to listen to us again, or will they just keep going in their parallel reality? Unless we have a really strong revolution and we change the way Parliament works, I can't see how they'll ever listen to us again. And every time I'm on with you, Neil, I'm moved by the truth that comes out of your mouth, which is the exact opposite of what we get from our politicians and from the mainstream media. And it's abhorrent and it must change. We need, we, we are owed the truth. We are the citizens of this country. As you said, we are sovereigns and we deserve to get the truth. Julie, do you have faith in much here in Great Britain now? Is there an institution or an authority that you look at and think, yes, that, that speaks for me, or, or in any event, I at least trust it? No, no. And, and I say that as someone who always used to have a place where I felt I had a political home. So I, I knew who I'd vote for. I knew what I believed in. And there were very obvious differences between the parties. And you had a choice that was there that you could identify with. And I think for the first time in my lifetime, I don't feel that anymore. I, I you know, we had Rishi Sunak this week and Keir Starmer. If you scrambled them up together, I wouldn't be able to tell you who said what, to be honest. I don't feel there's diverse voices out there for us to follow anymore. So, no, I don't, at the moment, feel much confidence at all. That is right, what you said there. If you were to take their speeches and just <laughs> make a Mes word salad yeah. out of them, yeah. it wouldn't matter. No. It wouldn't matter. No. Right, we're pushed for time already, uh, going into a break, after which, as pressure mounts on the NHS this winter, the UK Health, Secretary, uh, Health Security Agency rather, has issued new advice suggesting people feeling ill should return to wearing face masks. I'll have an expert on to debate the merits of the plan. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m., join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. OK, are face masks making a comeback? I think it's a question on, on the lips of many this week. Last week, the UK Health, Secret uh, 
Health Security Agency advised the donning of face coverings once more as the NHS battles overcrowding and predicts the highest waiting times on record. Where have we heard all that before? Joining me now to consider the advice uh, is Dr David Strain uh, from the University of Exeter Medical School. Uh, are you there? Hello there. Thank you for joining me. Hello, Neil. Hello. When so much evidence has stacked up saying masks make no difference, uh, even that they don't work uh, to, to stop the spread of a respiratory virus, what's the point of masks? So there, there are two, um, two types of masks that we consider. There's the masks that work as source control, and a second group of masks that can actually work to protect the individuals. Now, in order to protect an individual, you need the N95, the really high power respirators, the sort of things that we get when we're dealing with COVID patients in hospital. Now, I want to stress that's not what the UK Health Security Agency is talking about at the moment. What they're talking about are to reduce the risk of spread. So if you think about the face masks that we have, they're, they're effectively, they're, they're like a big grill and the COVID virus is like a pea, and that pea will shoot through the grill really, really easily. Those masks are not there to protect the individual wearing them. However, if you think about that grill and those peas again, you, the, the virus doesn't come out as an individual. It comes out as a big clump, almost like a bag of peas in a, a big frozen bag. And if that hits the grill, it stays on the inside. And so what the UK HSA is talking about is people who are potentially symptomatic with COVID or flu or any of the other viruses, if they were to wear a mask, then as they are breathing it out in the, the droplets that's coming out when they're talking, when they're having those conversations, the virus would be held on the inside of the mask and therefore reduce the risk of spreading it to people around them who may not be vaccinated or may not have the protection um, from the vaccine. I understand the theory. I hear what you're saying. Although I've also read that when the the when people breathe out the the bubble of whatever it is you're talking about actually gets sort of atomized by passing through the grill, and actually there's more airborne particles. But in any event, I understand what you're talking about. But where is the evidence that any face mask actually has any positive effect when it comes to stopping transmission? You know, where's the, where's the peer-reviewed research that conclusively shows that if you wear a mask, you're not going to spread your infection? So there's now a, a considerable series of data that's been collected over time looking at this as a source control. So um, I think one of the, the best set of data comes from 374,000 individuals who were wearing masks versus uh, people in the state nearby. So these are in the USA. 374,000 mask wearers versus a mirrored population in the state. And what it demonstrated with even 10% of the population wearing the mask reduced the likelihood of the disease spreading by approximately two thirds. Um, and that's one of many, many cases. There's, a, there's many of them. Uh, there's been a great study in Massachusetts looking in healthcare workers, looks at 9,850 healthcare workers. So this is not the people in the COVID service, this is people in the general health service. And, and what they demonstrate in that particular population is if we had universal mask wearing, it reduced the number of new infections by over half. It was exactly 51% that demonstrated that. There's been population-based studies based in Germany, in the USA, and they've also shown this similar picture. The mask wearing is all about source control. So it's not protecting you, it's protecting the people around you. And now we're in a day that people are who are vaccinated get very, very few symptoms from COVID. As you rightly said, that for many people fully vaccinated, the COVID is nothing more than the common cold. But that doesn't mean it's the case for everybody, particularly the elderly, particularly the immunocompromised. So actually what the UK HSA is asking is basically wear a mask because you care about your fellow man, not because you're scared of the virus yourself. But that, that, that rhetoric has been dismissed and discounted over and over again. I mean, for every paper that you're quoting and every, every bit of research that you're quoting that says that they have a beneficial effect, there are other esteemed experts who say that they do absolutely nothing at all. And in fact, in many cases, they're counterproductive. You know, it's holding, it's holding infection and other bacteria against your face. You're rebreathing your own infection if you have it, which is not good for your lungs. That's even before we get to all the... Uh, uh, the uh, the impact that, that face mask wearing has on kids. 
you know, we saw them wearing masks, my kids too, for eight hours a day at school or whatever, was very detrimental to people's emotional well-being, adults included. You know, is it surely, surely the, the balance of probability, the, the bulk of the evidence shows that reintroducing masks is about reinforcing the message of fear and reintroducing the idea that people who are good citizens wear masks and people who are bad citizens don't. That's not what the UK HSA have said. The UK HSA have come out and just said, if you are symptomatic, if you feel that you have a viral infection, the best way to show that you care about your fellow man and to make sure that you don't spread that virus is either stay at home and therefore don't spread it. And I mean, that just makes sense. If you're sick, you don't really want to be going out anyway. Or if you do need to go out, if you're going shopping, if you're going to engage, um, then if you're feeling sick, if you've got a viral illness, if you wear a mask, it will keep that virus in front of you. I mean, I, I do agree that you do end up breathing in these bacteria, you end up breathing in the virus. But remember, they are our viruses, there are bugs that we are breathing back in. The only reason they're in there in the first place is because we actually, they were in our lungs and they're part of us. They should be changed on a regular basis. And actually, I do agree with you that the, this, this constant reusing of them is contributing to the, the, the poor global picture. We should by now be having better masks that have the waterproof but are not contributing to these particle plastics. And that is something that people are working on. When it comes to bear, the emotional bear, bear well actually, bear it does me. affect adults. Bear with me while I broaden this out to my, to my guests children. here in the studio. Tonya, what do you make listening to this? It's like we're two years, three years on, and we're still hearing the same stuff. No, I mean, the, these studies that he's, he's talking about are, are you know, they're, they're, as you said, there are many opposing studies. The one study that was supposed to be the one is the Danish study that was done on masks. And that Danish study was done by a group that were pro-masks. And they came to the conclusion that masks do absolutely nothing. And the, the, but have, nothing good. Nothing, nothing good at all, exactly. So the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, and this, this constant nudge and propaganda, wear a mask if you're a good human being. Wear a mask if you're not a good human being, then you don't wear a mask. And th this in itself, the language that this... Dr. Professor is using, I find really sinister. I, I, I find it unpleasant. Julie, what do you make of it? I mean, are you, are, are you, I, I just feel as if we're, it's Groundhog Day. We, we, we were told all this years ago, and it's back again, despite mountains of evidence that, that speak to the contrary. And we know how much harm masks do. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you. It, during the pandemic at the beginning, I was a mask wearer. I was, because I was afraid. I was afraid of this unknown, awful disease that was going to kill us all, and I wore my mask. Um, but as time went on, and I've seen the studies, and I've seen that the studies now say that they don't work necessarily unless they are washed. They have to be the N95. They have to be washed every three to five days. Uh, we all have to have the same quality mask for it to even begin to work, and that's not the case. Um, so I'm not, I'm not anti... I, I believe COVID exists. I, I believe we need to sort it out. But I am now against it. I wouldn't wear it now for two reasons. One, I don't think they work uh, on the whole for everybody. And number two, I think that saying it now and also linking it to save the NHS if you wear a mask, I think, as Tonya said, that's quite offensive because it's putting the onus on us to save the NHS, but actually there's so much more as we know to saving the NHS. It's not about you wearing your mask to help save your granny not getting in the ambulance in time. I think um, we do need to look at how damaging masks can be to humanity. Mm. You know, how damaging they've been to our children, what they've done to our mental health, and what they are doing to the planet. Our seas are full of billions of masks that do nothing against an airborne virus. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to disagree with you. And no, I'm not a doctor, but I read studies day in, day out about masks. And I have not read a single study that's conclusive that masks can do any good, but I have read many, many studies that say masks are doing a lot of damage. Dr Strain, is it fair to keep leaning on people in that way that you are continuing to do, saying, you know, if you have respect and care for your fellow man, you wear a mask? You know, that is a, that's a repetition of part of what was clearly revealed as nudge unit strategy to, to corral people to influence behaviour because we were simply to be brought into line. We are just here talking about people who are feeling unwell themselves with a virus. We're in a day where you don't need to isolate. If you have a virus, you, um, you, 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 you can be continuing with life as normal. And this is just a step along the same lines as you wouldn't sneeze in a person's face, you wouldn't cough in a person's face. And unfortunately, if you are carrying this virus, you will be breathing it into a person's face.
I mean, the, the study that you're talking about there, that Danish study by Bundgaard that demonstrated no meaningful difference, it's important to say that study was comparing cloth masks to the, uh, the surgical face masks. That wasn't comparing face mask versus cloth mask versus nothing. What that demonstrated was that there was a numerical but not a significant benefit from having one of those facial waterproof surgical masks versus a, a, a cloth mask. That's not saying that they weren't beneficial. It's saying that actually, if you are protecting the people around you, and we are only talking about people who are sick. Um, yes. If I am not feeling sick, if I don't have a cough and cold, I don't need to wear a mask. Likewise, none of you would need to wear a mask. But if you were unwell, if you were coughing, if you were sneezing, that is a good time to be protecting the people around you in exactly the same way you would cough or sneeze into your arm. The problem is with these small viral particles, they can be on your breath. And I, I do also agree that this is not actually about saving the NHS. There are far more fundamental problems going on with the, the funding of the NHS over the last 10 to 15 years that need sorting out, not just putting a mask on. That's a, a, a bit of a nonsense. This is all about just the respect, if you are unwell at the time, for your fellow man. But I would say to you, Doctor, that it was incremental the last time. You know, everything started with it's only going to be about uh, you know, the, the, the restrictions are only going to affect the elderly, or only, only the elderly and the at-risk need to take vaccinations. And it was always incremental, and then gradually it spread from a small identified group until everybody had to get vaccinated, everybody had to wear face masks. And to me, this just sounds like the, the thin end of the wedge once again. Raise the subject of face masks, whichever face mask you want to call it, an N95 or the, or the, or the paper masks or whatever. But once they start appearing out there on the street again, and the nudge is if you're a good person, you wear one of these, and if you're a bad person, you don't, I just see it two, three years into this so-called pandemic, yet again, we're being pushed to be controlled and to live in fear of one another. So let me just say, I, I will not wear a mask if I am not unwell. I, I personally, and I, I regard myself as a good person. I'm in there seeing the COVID patients even today. Um, uh, and I still regard myself as a good person. I am not wearing a mask when I go to the shops, when I go to the pubs with my friends. This is just talking about people who are unwell at the time. And, and similarly, that whole conversation, I mean, we had a conversation about this mandatory vaccination, and even at the time, I absolutely stated, although I am very much in favour of vaccination, it must be about personal choice. It must be about weighing up those. And I think we actually had the conversation that there is no way I would give a vaccine to somebody who didn't want it. I think this mask is something else. This is just about protecting people around you whilst you are coughing, whilst you are unwell. And none of us uh, at this moment in time, whilst we are well, would be expected to do it. Actually, we don't need to go back to that full mandatory masking, uh, uh, masking. We don't need to go back to any of those things. But these are the small steps we can do to make sure that whatever the new variant comes along, whether it be this XB 1.5 or anything else that rears its ugly head, um, that we don't end up in a position where we have any of those infringements on our liberty just by protecting one another when we have that common sense. If you're sick, try not to spread it. Dr David Strain from the Exeter University Medical School, thank you. Always interesting to have your point of view and we'll catch up with that story again in the future, I'm quite sure. Now I have to go into another break, uh, after which uh, PM Rishi Sunak wants all school pupils to study maths in some form until the age of 18. Education expert and friend of Neil Oliver Live, Tom Buick, will be here to discuss the proposal. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeves & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. 
Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak wants all school pupils in England to study maths until they're 18. In his first speech of 2023, a wish list, you might call it, or an early letter to Santa, he said he wanted people to feel confident about their finances. Critics say it won't be possible without more money. Surprise, surprise. But is it even appropriate to compel every pupil to make time for maths right up until they leave school? Joining me to see if Sunak's plan adds up is education specialist and friend of the show, Tom Buick. Hello, Tom. Happy New Year to you, Good Tom. evening, Neil. What do you think of this idea, Tom, as Happy an education to specialist? You. What do you well, think look, of this uh, idea? I know the pun is overused, but the sum definitely do not add up. Um, I mean, first of all, this idea that we're an outlier in maths as a country. Actually, A-level maths is the most popular subject. All those students that have to, uh, if you like, progress on to other A-levels or other vocational qualifications, if they haven't got their maths at GCSE, they have to reset maths. So really, it was a bit of a non-policy, actually, that uh, the Prime Minister announced this week. And what troubles me about it, I mean, he said himself that this was personal for him. Of course, he went to the £45,000 a year in today's prices, Winchester College. That's a ratio. It's do the maths. That's 7.1 uh, times the uh, average cost of uh, a state secondary school pupil. We spend about £6,000 on them. So for me, it just seemed like a huge deflection away from what the real issue is uh, in our education system, which is 10 years of chronic underfunding. In fact, uh, secondary school funding in England has flatlined since 2010. In terms of adult education, which is where the real problem is, there are 8 million adults that don't have these basic numeracy skills. We've cut adult education classes by 40% in the last 10 years. So there were so many other issues, frankly, the Prime Minister could have got a handle of uh, with his big speech this week. I, I remember when I was at school, maths and arithmetic were two separate subjects. You set two different classrooms, sat different exams in in each. I can understand up to a point wanting to make people competent in relation to something like their finances, but maths, you know, the, surely the, the complexities and the nuances of maths are, are above the heads and unnecessary anyway for most people unless they are really wired up to pursue that kind of subject. Exactly. And that's why we have the GCSE maths at level two, which, if you like, is functional maths. It's uh, maths for citizenship. And it's absolutely right that we have that qualification. But if you're pursuing maths beyond that, really, it's about those who are destined for the scientific subjects. And to be fair, you know, we do have an issue in our universities. I think 40 percent of those who are on so-called STEM subjects don't have uh, level three or the equivalent of advanced level maths. So that will be an issue for those particular institutions. But actually, what about expanding history to 18, making that a compulsory subject? What about expanding drama, the arts, creativity? This country in more recent decades has made its way in the world in being, uh, if you like, you know, an empire of the mind, a sort of essentially we're a cultural hub 
for the rest of the world, of course aided by the fact that our language is uh, a, a world language these days. So there are lots of other subject choices, frankly, that you could yes. say they are worthy, they are deserving of uh, universality up until the age of 18. As yes, I say, yes. I think what really troubles me about this week's announcement is it's a huge deflection away from the real issue, which is the underfunding of education in our country. Just take the recent lockdowns. There's 100,000 pupils that have disappeared off the school rolls. That's a problem that needs tackling by the Prime Minister and by the Education Secretary. We're spending just £50 per pupil on catch-up recovery as a result of COVID. That compares to £1,800 uh, in the United States and £2,600 per pupil uh, in the Netherlands. So I, I just think there are other burning platforms the Prime Minister should have been standing on this week yep. when it comes to the education of our kids. Uh, absolutely. Julie, it, 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 seems, it seems to me that this is, um, this is symptomatic of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a different challenge that we have in education. Um, the AI, artificial intelligence and the rest, it seems to me, are going to overtake things numerical, things code, mm. faster than they overtake anything else. You know, isn't it misplaced to encourage people who aren't even gifted mathematically to move into that subject? Completely. And, and going back to, to what our guest just said, I would be far more confident about my finances if I knew that big businesses were paying their taxes. You know, I would feel far more confident going forward in life as a young person if I felt that life was fair and if, if mathematics was being used by the government to make the correct people pay what they should owe. That's my uh, thing. But also, I've got a child. I've got two children, 14 and 9. Uh, my son's about to do his options. Yes, math is important. I, I think we should teach maths to a degree where we can cope in life, arithmetic, getting, you know, getting your sums right, able to pay for something, uh, learn to pay the best mortgage, get the best deal, etc. things like that. But to force people who aren't mathematically minded, I, for example, was terrible at maths. I would have hated being forced to go into maths. It would have been awful. So, Rishi, no, no, we don't need maths now. What we need is... I think he's almost... Your house is on fire and he's saying, shall we paint that wall blue? He's, he's deflecting attention from much bigger issues at the moment, and maths is certainly not one of them. Tonya, why do you think he's coming at it this way? Why, why single out what is obviously his pet subject, his favourite subject? and inflicting it upon a, a population with other things to think about. I think it's complete deflection. But may I add, can I ask also, add that my daughter Sophia has a first in her maths degree and she was... She went to state school. Uh, so I'm not worthy. That, 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 is, that is what I'm talking about. People like who have her type of mind where math is wonderful to her. But she still complains about the basic math that's taught at school. She feels that GCSE level is not taught in a way that's practical for people to understand their finances in the further world. So if he really wanted to make a difference about his favourite subject, what he should have done is talked about redoing the GCSE. So it shows people how to pay taxes, and as we said, how to pay mortgages and things like that. They're the most important things to know about life and they don't get that in GCSE maths so if he wanted to make it something about his favorite subject that's what he should have done it was just all blush and bluster just to take our eyes off the real problem that we're having in society today Tom what Tonya is saying there makes sense to me uh, you know to you to concentrate on the practicalities of life in a mathematical context uh, you know, but, but still cut it off at the point where a, a a student, a pupil, no longer feels it's appropriate. But that would be right to, re to restructure things so that they were taught about tax and they were, talk you were taught to, you know, contemplate where money comes from and you know, quantitative easing and the rest. Would that not be more practical? Absolutely. And 12 years ago, Neil, I was responsible, actually, for the country's Enterprise UK scheme. This was a scheme in every school that was about giving young people uh, a £10 note and challenging them to turn it into a business, uh, a viable business proposition. Obviously, they learned all sorts of things during that exercise, financial literacy, how to read a balance sheet, how to open a bank account, um, you know, all the things uh, that Tonya, for example, was talking about there. Uh, but that was cut you know, uh, by this government uh, in 2010, and you know, they didn't restore it. So I think, as I think we're all agreeing on this panel, if the challenge here is about ensuring citizenship, financial literacy, that people don't feel cut off uh, from society, then invest in adult education, invest in our further education colleges, restore that £10 billion worth of cuts. He used to be the Chancellor, so you know I don't think the Prime Minister's got anywhere to run on this. 
he, with the uh, education secretary, in my view, Gillian Keegan, of course, now, we've had five of those in the last 12 months. Uh, I'm trying to keep up with uh, all the changes at the Department for Education. Uh, but, you know, there are some serious policies that need addressing. And whilst, you know, universal maths to 18 might be appropriate for some, it's not appropriate for everyone. But and we're should, not going to we... get, frankly, I'm not going to make any inroads to this bigger challenge, which we talked about a lot on your show, of poor skills, poor productivity, high levels of tax, low growth, you know, all the things that are driving everybody scatty at the moment. We're not going to, frankly, be able to achieve anything in that area uh, unless we get focus on the big ticket items in education. And maths ain't it. OK, thanks. For that. Tonya, we're going to have to hold that thought because I'm under time pressure yet again. Tom Buick, Education Specialist, thank you very much for your common sense approach this evening. Thanks, Neil. Good to After see you. the break, uh, we'll be meeting this week's Great Britain. I'll be delighted to welcome Simon Lee, a personal development expert who has helped hundreds of young people through difficult times. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Welcome back once again to Neil Oliver Live. Regular viewers of the show will know that I try and make a point of drawing attention to those who give of themselves to help others and so contribute to making uh, Britain great. My great Britain tonight is Simon Lee from Kent who endeavours to help those suffering from anxiety and all sorts of other challenges uh, in all their various forms and manifestations. Over three decades, Simon has established himself as a pioneer, seeking new ways to coach personal development and to develop mental strength. Good evening, Simon. Good evening. What led you in this direction? You know, three decades in, what, what was it that made you think, I can, I can better direct people? Well, for me, it was, it was a, an unfolding of my life, really. I came out of a very challenging childhood. Um, it's very difficult. Um, but, and it was a masterclass in how weak men create tough times. Um, so we went through some very challenging situations. But this experience was a necessity because, because it was so painful and so difficult. It, I wouldn't be able to do what I do today unless I'd been through that. So actually, looking back on it, I'm glad it happened because I gained so much knowledge. It, it feels, often feels to me at the moment that we're in the mess we're in, in the world, in this country, because of weak people. Absolutely, absolutely. I really believe that. I mean, as a, as a child, I, I saw it firsthand. I, I, I felt the experience up close of, of exactly how cruel they can be. And, you know, there's a societal belief that a strong man can be a problem, but there's nothing compared to what a weak man will do. 
is, is a real issue. So coming out of that experience, I couldn't stay as I was. I had chronic depression, chronic anxiety. I was extremely um, traumatised and I didn't even know it was trauma. No one spoke about it decades ago. So I thought, I, I can't live like this, so I'm going to go out and find a way, find my own path so I can overcome this and build a character I could be proud of and show people once I got there how to do the same. And that was the journey. And what did you do? What, did, what kind of challenges did you set yourself and how did you navigate a way back to a better frame of mind? Well, I made some big mistakes. The first big mistake was um, I won a um, Southern England bodybuilding title, which, which did take a lot of discipline. Um, but it was all about external validation. I became how I looked. So I stood on stage with this first place trophy and I thought, I'm still absolutely terrified. And so after that, I went into a huge depression because I realised it hadn't worked. And I went back to the martial arts after that. I did feel a fall ill for a long time because I, my first addiction in life was overtraining. And I think when you're um, a child, the first thing you find to soothe your own pain becomes your most potent addiction later on. For me, it was exercise. It's the only way I could find to soothe my pain. But ultimately, it, it led me to um, a long path of illness. How, how then did you find an equilibrium to the extent that you felt able, that you, you felt equipped with something that you could pass on to others? Well, I am um, falling ill was actually, um, I think it saved my life because I then went into mindfulness meditation. I looked, I started really delving into Zen Buddhism, Stoic philosophy, and these ancient philosophies that was all about peace, um, courage and integrity. And I felt like I found the holy grail. These things were so powerful. It was what I was looking for. So I, I put together a, a system I could and I went out and I started, I started teaching. So I went around local hospitals, talking about my recovery, talking about these philosophies, and the, the interest just built up gradually over time. And what kind of people are, are you able to help? Is it, is it all ages? Is it, you know, is it people who are coming out of trauma? Is it people just in, yes, I in, mean, in normal life? Who, who, I had to change. I know some, some, um, some teachers are also talking about this, but I had to change the narrative of trauma because I really believe in post-traumatic growth over post-traumatic harm. So when I started to give talks in schools and I go talks to, to young men, I used to say, who here put your hand up? Who's had, who's had a tough time? If it was the children, I'd say, have your mum and dad split up? Have you been through some tough times? And you'd always get a minority of hands going up. And I'd say, you've got more potential than anybody else in the room. And for the first time, they'd all look at each other and think, wow, no one's ever said that before. I thought we were supposed to feel sorry for ourselves. I thought, I thought we were supposed to be victims. So I had to change the narrative because I knew that that was true. So you see trauma as opportunity as absolutely to handicap absolutely hugely it is a portal to potential no doubt it's an interesting twist on things isn't it julie that idea because we are we are increasingly told to talk about our troubles but that that in itself breeds a kind of uh, victimhood doesn't it i agree i think there is uh, it's interesting what you're saying there's a strong pushback now i think people are more and more saying about post post traumatic uh, growth rather than post traumatic stress and as you say if you can channel that instead of weeping over it or or uh, who knows how we'd all behave in that environment but if you can channel that into something positive and to help others then more power to you absolutely i do think there is an enticement though in modern society and modern culture to be the victim mm. to not go forward to not do something with it and it can be, it can be, that itself can become an addiction. I've noticed it's so that a lot of... It's so empowering to change the language. The it way is. Just, the way just changing the language. It what is. What you just did there. Can you imagine a room full of children, those that feel that they've been damaged by what's happened to them, and you've just told them that they've got greater potential. That's so empowering for a child it to is. hear. It is. Again, they, they've, no one's told them that. Everyone else is saying, we poor hope you. you can cope, let's yeah. see poor you, um, this shouldn't have happened. Of course those things are true, but you've got to lead them somewhere else, otherwise they'll just stay there. Yeah. What about the, you know, I know that you're very invested in, uh, you know, exercise and training and, and martial arts. What is it that you feel martial arts gives someone who has trauma or who has you know, some kind of anxiety that they need Well, to I, I think there's a quote by Winston Churchill, and I really like it. He said, um, be kind, but be fierce. And I think what trauma does, it disconnects you from your sense of self. And you end up, and I was a very, very broken young man myself, but you need that... Um, a man and a woman needs that fierce aspect as well because the fierceness will push you forward, it will let you chase your dreams, it will protect you. The kindness will instill integrity and be compassionate to your fellow, fellow man. Um, I didn't have any fierceness. 
it was locked in me and I couldn't access it. I was terrified of everything. So I took up martial arts to find that fierceness. And wow, when I opened that door, I had trouble controlling it for a while because it was unknown territory. I hadn't explored there. So then I had this other struggle of getting it on a leash. But once I did, it was just a form of empowerment and it gave me conviction in my beliefs, in my words and how I lived. Jordan Peterson says over and over again, talking to young men, that they need to know that, there's, that there is a monster inside Absolutely. of all of us. Absolutely. And if you pretend to yourself that you're only nice, then you're much more dangerous than someone who has identified the fact that they're capable of the terrible. Absolutely. And they know it's there and they control it, master it, challenge it, and that makes them a much more complete person than someone who just says, I'm just a nice guy. And that's why that most of the men that I coach, when I say to them, who's your screen hero, they point towards Daniel Craig, because they want that robust, ultra-masculine part of them within themselves so that they can bring a balance to who they are. So it, it, it's, a really, it's a really big one, that, that creation and chaos, that, ability, that dark and light nature of a man. It makes him more... He's the one that won't be cruel because he has it under control. He's the one that will, be, will do great things. He will be just. He will be strong. Tony, in these times of where we've heard so much for years about toxic masculinity, I think it, particularly I feel it in relation to, you know, I've got two sons, I've got a daughter, but I've got two sons, and I, I feel that they need that positive, that positive message that they, they do have something very important to give, absolutely by dint of being male. Absolutely. So, like you, I've got, I've got two boys too, and, and it, they're being demasculinated all the time and told that they can't be real men, that they can't, you know, stroke stro strength because then it's toxic. It's not. I'm going to have I want to cut it short man. there, Simon. That was brilliant. I'm going to have to move on into the break, but thank you. No, Sorry to cut you short that's there. That's okay. <laughs> that's the end of the first hour, but plenty more to come on the show. And after the break, we'll be hearing all about the technological advancements we can look forward to in 2023. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good evening. If you're just joining us, welcome back to the rest to Neil Oliver live on GB News TV and on radio. Coming up on the second hour of the programme, we'll be hearing about some of the amazing technological advances which could shape our lives in 2023. We'll also be hearing all about Thor, the walrus, whose unexpected arrival at Scarborough Harbour led the, to the cancellation of a New Year's Eve fireworks display. Nutritionist Juliet Kello will be here with some tips on what we should be eating after the excesses of the festive season. And if that doesn't work, the green goddess Diana Moran will be here to give us some advice on keeping fit in the new year. 
All of that and more coming up, but first an update on the latest news from Aaron Armstrong. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Downing Street have described today's discussions between NHS leaders and the Prime Minister as highly valuable. The Prime Minister has been holding crisis talks with uh, those experts at Number 10 in an effort to ease the pressure on the NHS. Rishi Sunak has reiterated his commitment to providing £14 billion of additional funding for the health service. Chief Executive of the Day-Lewis Pharmacy Group, Jay Patel, says the talks were constructive. You know, the session was a, it was a small group of us, um, lots of insight in terms of what the problems really are out there, balance between community pharmacy and general practice, and some great description of what the core issues are out there on the ground. The PM was very receptive to what we discussed and, and we explained the issues, and then we swiftly moved on to looking at options that we could put into place to be able to rapidly see if we can alleviate some of those challenges. And the Shadow Minister for Public Health, Andrew Gwynne, says further reforms, though, are needed to fix the crisis. Everybody who has an interest in the National Health Service really should be round the table, trying to work out not only the short-term measures that are needed to get us through the rest of this winter, but also how we then put health and social care on a sustainable footing, the kind of reforms that are needed, the kind of investment that's needed for the long term, not just sticking plasters. Shelling's continuing in Ukraine despite Russia's proposed 36-hour ceasefire. Missile strikes have been heard in the eastern city of Bakhmut, as one resident described the situation. Our town used to be so beautiful. There were roses everywhere, flowers. It was clean. Everything was kept in order. Well, 60% of Bakhmut has now been destroyed. Russia has declared its forces would observe a unilateral ceasefire for Orthodox Christmas. Uh, that was immediately dismissed by Kyiv as propaganda and as a cynical trap. The Kremlin, though, claims its troops have only fired in retaliation to attacks from Ukrainian forces. The Foreign Secretary has condemned Iran's execution of two protesters. James cleverly called the hangings abhorrent and has urged the country to immediately end the violence against its own people. Iran executed the two men for allegedly killing a member of the security forces during nationwide demonstrations following the death of the 22-year-old Kurdish Iranian woman, Masa Amini, last September. Police in the United States have arrested a six-year-old boy after he shot and seriously injured a teacher at a primary school in the state of Virginia. Officers say the woman's injuries were initially thought to be life-threatening, but her condition has improved in hospital. Uh, the chief police officer has said the shooting was not an accident and the two had what has been described as an altercation. It's unclear how the child got hold of the handgun. The RMT says rail companies at the heart of the long-running dispute over pay made hundreds of millions of pounds of profits during the pandemic. The union claims uh, huge amounts of money were generated when government, the government awarded private train operators those new contracts. During COVID, they say companies made up to £310 million in taxpayer-funded profits between March 2020 and September 2022. It comes as the RMT and 14 train operators continue their 48-hour walkout over pay, jobs and conditions. MPs have been urged to support paid leave for miscarriage. The proposal by a member of the SNP would grant three days of statutory paid leave to parents who experience a miscarriage before 24 weeks of pregnancy. Angela Crawley says it would give parents the time needed to grieve. Currently, paid bereavement leave is only given following stillbirth after 24 weeks. Prince Harry claims he was not the real best man at the wedding of his brother, the Prince of Wales. In more leaked excerpts from his memoir, The Duke of Sussex, reportedly says the role was fulfilled by the brothers' two closest friends. He also suggests King Charles feared Meghan would dominate the monarchy and steal the limelight from Charles and Camilla. Referring back to his military days, Harry says he killed 25 Taliban fighters, a claim which has been criticised by both the British Army and the Taliban. And flood warnings are in place across England and Wales as heavy downpours are set, set to hit the UK overnight. There are 27 flood warnings in place for England, 
eight more in place for Wales. And in Scotland, the Environment Protection Agency has issued six flood alerts. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now back to Neil Oliver Live. Welcome back once more to Neil Oliver Live. New Year, new technology. That's certainly how it feels with technological advances coming at us from every direction. My next guest looks to the future, the very near future, to assess the likely impact of new ideas around subjects ranging from food preparation by robots to sources of cheaper energy and innovations around confronting climate change. Laurie Smith is head of Foresight Research for Nesta and joins me now. Good evening, Laurie. Good evening. Thank you for having me and Happy New Year. <laughs> Good to see you. Happy New Year. The speed of technological innovation can be overwhelming. That would be fair to say, no? Yes, yeah, it certainly can feel overwhelming at some time, at times. And it, it very much depends on the techno technological area as well, doesn't it? So I suppose with digital technologies, there are rapid advances in areas like artificial intelligence and the internet. But in other areas, um, for example, uh, let's say the sit-down toilet, that hasn't changed much um, in quite, quite a long time. And in fact, some people are saying that um, there isn't enough innovation, it isn't happening quickly enough. So for example, the investor Peter Thiel said in 2013 that um, uh, we look, they promised us uh, flying cars and what we got was 140 characters referring to Twitter. So the uh, speed of technology really can vary from area to area. I hear you talking there about you know AI, artificial intelligence, and, and it's a it's a constant uh, point that I ponder myself. Will there be useful things for us mere mortals to do in a world dominated by tech like artificial intelligence? Well, I suppose if we, I think one one way of thinking about this is looking back at history, say to the Industrial Revolution, where you had groups of people, let's say like Luddites, who are really quite worried about the consequences of technology uh, and sort of smashed um, machines. But if you look around today, even in tough economic times like we're experiencing at the moment, there's, there's quite a lot of jobs around and many jobs you might not have imagined even existed. Um, people 200 years ago might even thought existed, like perhaps mine or perhaps even yours, for example. Um, and also, I'd much rather live in the world that we live at the moment with the benefits of uh, automation and technological change, things like TVs and fridges and computers and um, the internet. And a lot of what this boils down to is the choices society makes and how it supports people through technological change. So, for example, does it give them opportunities to retrain? So rather than have all of education at the start of people's lives, it might be spread more throughout their lives or decent social security net. So if people lose their jobs um, through uh, technological change, they've got sort of a safety net to help them out or ensuring the benefits of technological change are widely shared rather than just grabbed by a few. Now, you talk about jobs for, uh, for, for regular people like ourselves, and uh, I saw in some of the notes reference to a robo-chef. Tell us more about that. Yeah. Yes, yes, so this, is a, this is a really interesting um, advance. So um, there was a, the first real-world field trial of a food service robot called Sembler, um, it's made by a UK-based firm called Carapuri, and it was tested out at the headquarters of the online grocer's Ocado, and it can personalise food, it can make um, katsu curry, for example. And I think one of the most interesting aspects of Robot Chef, certainly for me, are its potential health consequences, uh, which could be good or could be bad. Surely that's bad news, for example, uh, for, for people who make their living preparing and delivering food. You know, doesn't doesn't that just close an avenue of employment for a whole a whole section of the population if food preparation and delivery is taken over by robots? Well, it depends again how these technologies um, are de deployed and the choices that we make. I mean, there is an example of a, a food robot called Wingman in the United States, which makes unsurprisingly um, chicken wings and also French fries as well. And there are claims that it can reduce employers' wage bills by up to seventy five percent. Um, which you could see how that could have big consequences for jobs. But lots of the people who deploy and um, use the technologies would argue that the robots actually can complement people. So, for example, people might be used, say, in customer-facing roles, um, while robots might be, say, used in food preparation. You also need people to do things like stock the robots and maintain them and program them. And again, it comes down to the choice society wants to make. So if 
You have suitable retraining and restructuring of workplaces, and the benefits of those robots are widely shared. You have lots of winners. You have workers could win, employers could win, and customers could win. If, however, one group grabs all the benefits at the expense of another, let's say employers to say chefs, for example, then you might not get such a good outcome. Tony, you're listening to that. You've, you're a chef. I you, am. you. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm. Maybe I am a Luddite, but what's your instinctive reaction to, to the idea that rather than preparing food and handling food, you were just loading and programming yeah. a robot? It, my instinctive reaction is to viscerally dislike it completely. And I don't, I mean, you know, as you said, of course, employers won't want to em employ chefs, especially within kind of the casual dining food industry that you have. You know, we need people to, to cook those foods. And, and once they're gone, we won't need them again. And what you're talking about being customer serving, we know facing, we know now that you go into a lot of these, like one, Leon, and I can mention many other ones, but they, they you, you order online, you order anyway on a, on a tablet. You don't actually look at the people. The people that are doing the jobs are the ones behind in the kitchen. So we're going to lose all these jobs. So I, I, I mean, I'm not a Luddite. I, I do think that progress and is, is a wonderful thing, but I think it should be aimed at other things, not putting people out of jobs. And uh, coming back to you there, w w you've, you've also mentioned in the notes uh, re-engineering nature to reach net zero. Now, could you explain a little bit about that? And also, is net zero even a good idea? Um, well, I suppose re-engineering re um, re -engineering nature, this is the signal we saw was uh, an experiment that was done in the Arabian Sea, just off the coast uh, of Goa, where they put in iron filings and rice husks and various other things. And the intention was to create a sort of bloom of life that would suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then ultimately end up burying it in the sea. So it's a way of potentially tackling um, climate change. Um, there's some risks to those sorts of technologies and they're very, very um, experimental. I'm not necessarily advocating for them. So we're spotting signals, not necessarily supporting them. I suppose on sort of um, net zero, well, um, the, certainly my understanding is the overwhelming majority of scientists believe that uh, greenhouse gas emissions are going to cause some pretty big problems in the world and so years to come, some of which we're sort of seeing already, or at least can be indirectly linked to climate change. You know, for example, the big heat wave we had um, last summer, some extreme weather events in the rest of the world. And also with things like, say, the plummeting costs of renewable energy, actually, the, there's a case to sort of move to some of these technologies anyway. So if renewables end up being cheaper than, say, gas, which is turning out to be a problem at the moment, and also perhaps more secure, Britain's got lots and lots of wind, um, then actually there's, there's, there's other cases we're doing as well as the environmental case. Julie, don't you feel, listening to that, I feel when it comes to the climate crisis, in inverted commas, that we're chasing and spending, well, vast sums of money prob problem solving where a problem may not actually exist? Yeah, and, and I think also going back to the wind turbine thing, you know, we, we have a load of them in this country and we have a lot of wind and we're not pursuing that as perhaps strongly as, as we ought. Um, but, but also, I think, going back to the the AI and the, and the jobs that are going to go, unfortunately, I, there's not much point fighting for a, a climate if none of us have jobs and none of us have a future. I mean, I worry for... I'm not Again, I'm not a Luddite, to use the phrase, but I do worry if we're focusing so much on these on these new AIs and, and new technology, what's going to happen to the young people coming out of school now? Um, how are we going to secure them to have jobs for life? I know that won't exist, perhaps, but, you know, we really need to look at that as well. That, that, is, that is a point, isn't it, Laurie? As, as I listen to this conversation, as, as I listen to what you're saying, it sounds in, in almost every instance that people will at best service machines. You know, wh when, are we going to, when are we going to do more for the people, you know, rather than prioritising machinery and technology and just trying to, you know, into the gaps, nudge people to, to service that technology? Well, I suppose it doesn't necessarily have to be servicing technology because whole new um, things can be, um, uh, whole new industries can be made. You know, with technology, for example, you don't, you didn't have a TV industry 200 years ago, so you wouldn't have had presenters, you wouldn't have had people doing the weather, you wouldn't have had researchers and engineers to support that. Some of those jobs are supporting machines. Some of the jobs are doing totally different things. And some of the things that, that machines can do, not all, are actually are quite boring, are quite unsafe, um, might not be involved sort of long hours. So. There can be some benefits of that. I'm so, I should add, I'm, I don't blindly support technology and don't think it's always good. And I think I'm a sort of 
um, may be mildly optimistic about technology, that with the right social choices with things like retraining, giving people time to adapt to that, it can end up being a good thing to get so many beneficial things in people's lives. Laurie Smith, Foresight Researcher. It's a fascinating topic. I'll admit I'm in... Uh, I'm very ambivalent about the supposed benefits of the technology at this point. I feel increasingly that people are going to be made uh, irrelevant as well as redundant. And that's a, that is going to be an abiding concern for me. But uh, Laurie Smith, thank you very much for your contribution so far this evening. Thank you for your time. After the, after the break, we will be hearing all about Thor the Walrus, who has been a surprise visitor to Scarborough Harbour uh, and more recently Blythe in Northumberland. On Mark Dolan tonight from 8, it's the People's Hour, in which I'll be taking your video calls on the big stories of the day. We'll get more from the fallout from Prince Harry's forthcoming book with the Queen of US Royal reporting, Kinsey Schofield. In the big question, do you want to see sex toys in supermarkets? Plus tomorrow's papers, my all-star panel, and in my big opinion, the siren voices for COVID measures are getting louder. Just say no. And in my take at 10, the woke British Museum wants to return British treasure overseas. We've lost our Elgin marbles. We're live from eight. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back. Now, in ways I find hard to describe, the fact Scarborough cancelled its New Year fireworks so as not to upset a resting walrus struck me as one of the most heartwarming bits of news of the whole festive period. And, and I speak as one who doesn't like to think of councils cancelling anything. Now that same walrus, nicknamed Thor, 
has just moved on from his latest stopping point at Blythe in Northumberland. Those tracking his movements hope he will now head north to Arctic waters where he more properly belongs. Tor's stay in Blythe was monitored by the British Divers Marine Life Rescue and my next guest is Dan Jarvis from that association who can tell us more about Tor's travels. Good evening, Dan. Good How evening. are you? Good to see I'm you. I'm well, thank you. And yourself? I'm good. Now, the pictures of Thor have been amazing. Uh, one thing I couldn't quite gauge, though, just how big is an Arctic walrus? Uh, well, Thor is a young adolescent male. Uh, we estimate his weight anywhere between half to three quarters of a tonne. Uh, however, a fully grown male can be well in excess of a tonne, so, so he's still not anywhere near fully grown at the moment. So he is really impressive in size already, but will, in a few years, be even more impressive. Absolutely. Now, what would he have been doing so far south? Well, we're treating this uh, in conjunction with the other recent walruses that we've had around Europe. This is, this is the fourth one that we've had in two years in Europe, the third uh, in the UK in two years as well, in fact, which, which is unusual. So, so we're treating it as, you know, potential warning signs with climate change of the reducing ice habitat in the Arctic, forcing these animals further afield. Um, we're aware that Arctic researchers have documented walruses being uh, sort of forced to use island habitats more frequently rather than the ice flows where they should be. So this is our concern is that, uh, you know, is this an early warning that we might see more walruses or, or other Arctic species, for example, venturing further afield to find more suitable habitat as, as they're losing theirs. Why, if he's, a, if he's a cold water animal, why would he follow uh, or, or, or track into warmer and warmer water, such as we have around our temperate coastline? Uh, well, most of the walruses that have turned up in recent years have been uh, juvenile or young adult animals, which do tend to spend their first few years of life before they become fully mature uh, animals, uh, sort of exploring their habitat. They do range much wider and further than their adult counterparts. So uh, potentially as they are ranging further and further afield, potentially due to climate change, we can't say that for definite or sure, but potentially due to climate change. These animals that do tend to be wandering further because of the life stage that they're at are just venturing further into European waters, uh, looking for new habitats, looking for food sources, uh, before hopefully returning there where they came from. You, you, you mentioned that it's not the first time that, that uh, a walrus has come into our waters. How often? What are the previous incidences have there been of such visitors? Yeah, absolutely. So the last walrus in the UK was known as Freya. Uh, she travelled again through Europe. Uh, she came to Northumberland in uh, November of 2001, and she then spent Christmas and New Year at Shetland. Uh, she then uh, went over to Norway a few months later, uh, and unfortunately back in the summer of this year, uh, due to uh, what we perceive at BDMLR as a lack of uh, proper management by authorities over there, by government officials, allowing large crowds of people to gather in close proximity, uh, potentially putting themselves in danger. They elected to actually uh, put her down, uh, which came as a huge shock, and there was a, a significant international backlash as a result of that. Um, they, really? So, they, put, uh, they, put the animal, they put the animal down? Why? That seems that sounds inexcusable. Absolutely, yeah. There, were, there was international outrage about this at the time that it happened. It was around uh, sort of August time uh, when this happened. Uh, she'd found her way up to Oslo, so of course, uh, you know, a high population centre. Um, we offered advice. Uh, we, we were there, ready at the end of a phone or an email to provide advice and support. Uh, based on our experiences of having dealing, de dealt with walruses in the last uh, couple of years that have been uh, difficult to manage. Uh, but we received no communication back, unfortunately. Um, there was an assurance back in June that the animal was not going to be put down, although it was rumoured that this was being discussed. 
Uh, and right up till August, uh, that message was still being put about. And then suddenly, within a couple of days, uh, Freya was just put down by the authorities. And they claimed that this was because she presented a danger to the public. Whereas if you see the photos and hear the stories of what happened in Oslo, you can see people virtually within touching distance, large crowds, dozens if not hundreds of people within touching distance of Freya. Goodness. And it's important to remember these are wild animals. You, you, you know, they are outside of their normal habitat. They don't normally come across humans and therefore don't have an inbuilt wariness. So they potentially will allow people to come surprisingly close to them. But if they are provoked, if they feel threatened, they will be defensive. Uh, you know, they will protect themselves. Uh, you know, it might be that they do the fight or flight response, which if they can't easily escape, it might cause an injury to somebody. And that could end badly for the animal as well. That, Tonya, listening to that, that sounds like a violation to me. My, my, when I saw, that's not, what, that's not obviously what's happened to Tor, but that, when I saw the images of Tor uh, in Scarborough and then in, in Blythe, it was magical. I thought just, to, to see that creature in, in close proximity as a visitor, I thought, I mean, it really touched my heart. And I, and I love the fact that he's this kind of nosy little thing who went kind of... You're not whether, well. Whether, 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 well, whether it's climate change or whether it isn't, he just, as, as they said, adolescent walruses are more adventurous. And so this, this little guy, <laughs> big guy, Thor, decided that he was going to have a little nose around our island. Can you imagine if we put him down? I mean... Where was the thinking there? What was mm. the thought behind it? But there is, but there is a, don't you think, uh, Julie, there's a magic whenever we get, you know, whether it's a rare bird uh, or, you, you know, or, or, or some other visitor from the, from the natural world that doesn't necessarily belong here. There's such an excitement and a, an electricity to, to, you know, a brief encounter of that nature, is there not? Oh, yeah, and, and Thor was actually on my neck of the woods. It was on the coast in the south first, I believe, because uh, there was a beach near us and it was all on local social media, Thor's there. And what I found interesting was after what happened to poor Freya, because I did read about that, uh, people were a lot more mindful not to crowd the animal, not to go down there, although how tempting it must have been, I know, to go and get pictures. But people say, no, don't get too close, don't go near. Um, and thankfully, obviously, the animal was allowed to then go off on its merry way. But I think it's terrible what happened to the, the other war. I think it's unforgivable. Uh, Dan, where is where is Tor now, so far as we can tell, or has he disappeared once and for all? Uh, that's probably the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, we'd love to know. Um, we've only been tracking him through sightings being reported to us and using photos uh, of markings on his body to determine that this is definitely the same walrus. Um, so uh, that. You know, there's no actual tracker on the animal. We haven't got a satellite tracking device on him or anything. So we don't know where he is at the moment. But uh, from his latest movements coming up from the English Channel, where he'd been previously, where you'd seen him down at Southampton or heard about him down in Southampton uh, before Christmas, uh, you know, he's making a definite movement back north now. And this is what we really hope for these animals, is that they do make these long uh, journeys, they do need the stop-offs in between to recover their energy, uh, to feed up, put weight back on, and that's why it's been really important to us in getting messaging out there whenever he does turn up and, and wherever he does turn up, that it's really key to avoid disturbing him as much as we possibly can, because any disturbance, especially repeated disturbances where he's been woken up, being forced to go in the water because he doesn't feel comfortable being there, for instance, it's going to impact on his ability to survive and his ability to make it back to the Arctic. So, uh, you know, we've been really, really grateful, uh, you know, hugely grateful to the authorities, the police and other organisations who have been working with us and also the public, who by and large have been massively supportive followed the advice. There's only been one or two very small exceptions where we've had to ask people to, to you know, not try to get really close up for photos, for instance. Um, and we're giving him the best possible chance at getting back to the Arctic under his own steam. Dan Jarvis from the British Divers Marine Life Rescue Association, thank you so much. A wonderful story, heartwarming stuff. Uh, and it, please, if you do find out what's happened to Tor, uh, will you come back and let us know? Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Thank you. After the break, nutritionist Juliet Kello will be here to tell us that even if we overindulged over Christmas, we don't need to completely cut out our favourite food and drink. Sounds like advice I can get on board with. See you in two minutes.
We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Now it's that time of year again when many people consider their physical condition and appearance and vow to make changes. All of that festive excess, uh, the food and booze, the lying around in pyjamas all day takes a toll after all. My next guest, uh, nutritionist Juliet Kello, joins me to consider what might be done in January to lay the foundations for a healthier year. Good evening, Juliet. Thank you for joining us. Oh, good evening. Thanks ever so much for having me. Lovely to be here. Good, good. Now, what's to be done, Juliet, uh, to turn us uh, into beautiful, healthy people, even if we weren't before Christmas? <laughs> Well, I think the first thing to say is really we need to get away from all these restrictive fatty diets. It's the time of year when we typically go all out for kind of starving ourselves, skipping meals, skipping lots of our favourite foods. And we really need to be moving away from that and start to think about eating, not just for our waistlines, but actually, more importantly, eating for our overall health. Um, and it's an interesting one because there was some research that came out earlier in the week, which was showing when it comes to um, New Year's resolutions, we're still prioritising weight loss. Nearly half of the people of over 2,000 that were surveyed said weight loss was their absolute priority above other aspects of their health, so whether that's their mental well-being, whether it's their heart health with blood cholesterol and blood pressure, whether it's even their immune system, particularly at this time of year when we know that there are so many problems um, with, with coughs and colds and, and nasty bugs doing the rounds. So we really need to start changing the narrative and start thinking about eating for our general health rather than just our waistlines. And actually the two go hand in hand. 
Um, we found also from the research that um, there was lots of restrictive behaviour going on. So people were planning on cutting out a lot of foods that they considered to be unhealthy. So typically things like burgers, things like pizza, for example. But actually, from a nutrition point of view, um, people were also planning on cutting out foods which actually have some really great nutrients in them. So cheese was an example here. We found that one in three people were planning on cutting out cheese because they thought it was unhealthy. With my nutrition head on, actually cheese is packed with protein for our muscles. It's got calcium and phosphorus for our bones. It's got vitamin B12 for our nervous system. So really it's about getting the balance right, not restricting our diet and really moving towards eating more of the, of the foods which are really great for us rather than cutting other foods out of our diet um, and restricting. But Julia, it is true to say, isn't it, that we are an increasingly unhealthy, overweight, depressed population. Why is that? You know, I, I'm, social media, I've noticed recently, is full of images of the 1970s beach scenes where, you, you know, you cannot find a single overweight person, you know, in a, in a, a beach scene of hundreds, if not thousands of people. Where did it all go wrong during the course of my lifetime? Yeah, it's a very, very good question, actually. Um, what we do know is that um, our lifestyles have become far less active, so we don't have the general activity. And this isn't just necessarily about going to the gym. We tend to move less. We sit behind desks more often. Our leisure time, a lot of the time, is is sitting down. And particularly, we've had this, haven't we, for the last two or three years through, through various lockdowns. Um, and also our eating habits have changed quite dramatically. We've moved away a lot of the time from cooking. We're relying far more on processed foods, foods which are very high in fat, high in sugar, high in salt. So I think what I want to do is to try and encourage everyone to move away from this kind of like, let's constantly focus on what we should be restricting from our diet and instead start moving towards the foods that we should be encouraging people to eat more of. And this is a lovely message for New Year. Quite often in New Year, it's all about cutting out. This is about adding into our diet. So adding in things like fruit and vegetables, adding in things like the plant-based protein. So that would be things like your beans, your lentils, your chicken peas, things like nuts and seeds, adding more whole grains into our diet as well. So swapping the kind of like the white bread, pasta and rice for the whole grain varieties to add fibre to our diet. And that really forms the basis for a really great healthy diet and also cooking more as well. So we have lost the skill of cooking in many instances. We need to get back to cooking because it gives us control. We can add more of those lovely foods in and cut down on sugar and salt too. Bear with me, Juliet. Tonya, you're a chef. You're also, you know, someone who's very invested in, in you know, uh, general health and well-being. Why, why do you think we have metamorphosed during the course of my lifetime, from a predominantly slim population to a predominantly overweight population? What's going on? Well, I've just got to add that we are together in this because I'm a nutritionist as well. And one of the things that that has changed is, is processed food and bad foods. That, that are being sold as being good foods and when they are really terrible for us. You know, you have these packets as low fat, but it's full of sugar and it's and we're being conned as a society. Unfortunately, we're not being educated properly on how to eat. Um, and we should be eating a lot more protein than we're eating. All we're doing is eating carbohydrates. We're only going to damage us if we're eating a predominance of carbohydrates and not enough protein in our diet. Julie, do you consider yourself to have a good diet? I, I, I mean, I'm very mindful of the fact that diet really means a lifestyle. It's not really necessarily just about what you eat, but you know, do you consider that you have a, a responsible approach to, to what you put into your body? Yeah, I do now. Um, I didn't. That's that's the thing. Then I agree with what Juliet is saying, is that we need to sort of get away from saying what's bad, what's good, and, and thinking that the 31st of December means at midnight we have to do something else. I think it is a lifestyle and it needs to be out enjoying what you eat and cooking and enjoying what you put in and seeing it as a nurturing thing, eating, not just simply for fuel or for overeating um so yeah I, I it took me a while though I was in my you know 20s I ate terribly like most young people do but um now I I think I see it as sort of looking after yourself to eat well and I think that's important uh Tonya I can't yeah. let this opportunity pass without bringing up the fact that you were uh Miss South East Britain natural bodybuilder in 1997 100 years ago 100 years talk ago. about nutrition um <laughs> I know I think we have some pictures we have the proof 
So that, that I must admit, this was an extreme kind of nutrition to get to get that lean. I was a natural. It was an, it was a natural bottle build. There's no drugs involved, and I was Miss South East Britain. Yes, a long time ago. Um, that was quite. You had to be really on your diet then, because the whole thing is, is you're trying to build muscle and stay lean, which is the ideal. Um, but for competitive levels, there when you get to get on stage in a bikini. Amazing. <laughs> Oh my God, it, it, it is a little bit f but, further than what your, your normal person needs to do to be healthy. That's yeah. the truth of it. Ju Juliet, uh, you're still there, I hope. I am. Uh, the, my, my, uh, my eldest son is very much about uh, going to the gym at the moment. And my, my youngest son actually is, is following in his footsteps. And I, I, was, I, was, I didn't know quite what to make of the moves two or three years ago now. But as, ta as Tony is saying, the, I'm, I'm sold on it now because he is so attentive about his overall well-being. He pays a lot of attention to food. He pays, a lot, and not in any kind of unhealthy fatty way. He just knows where proteins are. He knows where carbohydrates are. He knows, you know, the, you know, to pr prioritise cooked food against you know processed food and all the rest of it. So I think there's, there is something to be said for what is a, a definitely a fashion at the moment uh, for paying that kind of attention to the to the way we look. Yes, absolutely. I mean, protein is such an important nutrient for maintaining our muscle. And actually, the other thing is, as we get a bit older, um, certainly we start to lose muscle in our 40s. Now, what we need to do is really be doing the exercise and the activity to maintain our muscle strength, but supporting that with a really great diet. And I think we do have um, in this society, we've got this feeling particularly if you're doing going to the gym if you are exercising you have to have protein shakes you have to have protein powders when in actual fact we can get more than enough protein plenty by eating sensibly by eating a healthy balanced diet and we can go for the plant proteins as i mentioned earlier so things like your pulses your nuts and your seeds have a good amount of protein we can still enjoy lean meats and chicken. We can enjoy eggs if we want to. We can enjoy the low fat dairy products, which literally just have the fat taken out, but have everything else. So for example, one, one great example would be to have a low fat eat lean cheese, which has all of the protein, all of the calcium, all of the vitamins in, which would have the regular cheese. But you get that protein without the actual saturated fat, which we know but is I think, great I think, for our heart. I think we, we've got to be really careful not to demonise good fats, because I think even fats in cheeses are, are good fats. And as we get older, as you said, as you as you get to over forty, you know, you mm. try to at, start to atrophy muscle, and as you get older, you get sarcopenia. But the reality is, is that you have to have more protein. And plant-based proteins are all well and good, but that you, we don't absorb them as well. And as we get older, we don't absorb protein as well anyway. So I think mm. you know, good lean meats and eggs, eggs are the, are the best food in the world. I mean, we should just be eating more of them. What's wrong? What's wrong with with fatty meat though? I keep oh, on I hearing, you know, when you, that that aspect of keto, for example, you know, with this you know, paying attention to consuming quite a lot of fat. Uh, you know, fat's had a bad rap, hasn't it? Animal fat. Uh, you know, at it's home, you know, we, we, cook with, we cook with lard, for example, rather than, rather than uh, vegetable oils or seed oils or any of that. You know, I think, I think fat as well as, you know, what's all this lean meat stuff? What about fatty meat? <laughs> We do have to be careful with the saturated fat, though, because we do know that saturated fat does inc increase our cholesterol levels if we're having it too in great quantities. And obviously, high cholesterol is then a risk factor for our heart health. So we do really need well, to be... Yeah, but you don't, you, don't get, you, don't get, you, don't get, you don't get cholesterol from what you eat, do you? Well, not, well you do sometimes, but, I mean, seed actually... Uh, Vegetable oil has proven now to be one of the most toxic things that we can put in our bodies, you know, and especially if you've had animals that are reared properly, because that's the whole thing, isn't it? You know, how the animal has lived, you know, humanely reared, um, for example, you know, wild boar fat is, is just as good for you as, as salmon fat. So, you know, there's so much confusion. I do understand people get very, very confused, but I, I don't think the alternative is to go for something that's been processed. I think it needs to, to be something that you've cooked from home and, and you've, you've bought the best meat and animal products that you can afford. That's the message, that's the message. I'm running out of time again. Juliet Kello, nutritionist, thank you so much. It's a fascinating subject about which I freely admit I could get quite obsessive, uh, but thanks for your contribution this evening. Going into final break, after which, as if all those great nutrition tips weren't enough, the green goddess, Diana Moran, will be live in the studio to tell us how we should go about keeping fit in the coming year. Don't go away.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems and Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Welcome back. Now, it seems to me that we live in a world, uh, he, well, here in this country, divided between those who live by the gym, by diet, by all manner of focus on the body beautiful, uh, and those who are eating, drinking, and salad dodging their way towards early oblivion. Is there a happy medium, I ask myself? Is there a middle ground that ensures general health and well-being without the process uh, taking over our lives? Joining me now is someone who really does have the kind of answers I'm looking for. Diana Moran, green goddess of my of my youth. Oh, I remember you. I remember you so such a young well. Boy. Yeah, just <laughs> just a lad. But I remember you so clearly from you know uh, breakfast television and 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 all of that. So you know, I was I was the right age to be. I'm fully plugged into who you are. Um, and it's a real treat to have you here in the studio rather than trapped in one of the boxes on the screen. So thanks for being with us. <laughs> what is the secret? You've acquired wisdom you know, throughout your life. What is the secret to that kind of well-being? Mo moderation in all things. It's that simple. I really, really do mean that. Don't be ex excessive about exercise. Don't be excessive about food. And don't be excessive about all of this as well. Honestly, it really is moderation in all things. We were talking with the previous guest. You know, I'm, I've, I've really noticed, well, I've known for years, how many of the, of the general population are very big. Do you know, Neil, I'm absolutely appalled at the minute and I begin to think, where did I go wrong in uh, the start of breakfast time in the 80s, 80... We, we're just about to celebrate 40 years of starting breakfast time. Yeah. And I was so conscious then of people's shape. And if you saw somebody who was overweight, you thought, now, is a 
Is that a genetic thing or is it because of some medications, steroids or something they're taking? So you made a slight excuse. But the rest of the people in front of you were generally of a good weight. OK, they probably were a bit out of shape and you, you yeah, know, they weren't a, as energetic issue, as yeah. they should be. But I've just come back from a working cruise and I've just been somewhat appalled that the people who were on it were aged, shall we say, 55, 60, to my sort of age, the 80s and the likes of. And my goodness me, what a lot of them were obese. Let's be honest, they were obese. And, and there has been this insidious process by which being that size has become not Normal. just normalised, but it's actually, it's, we're actually being preached at that it's somehow a desirable state to be vastly overweight. It, it isn't... Uh, all those years ago, and I'm sure you girls were the same, when you were younger, you would look and you would see sort of, how am I doing? Mm. And if you had put a bit of excess weight on, then you'd make certain that you changed your eating habit a little bit or got a bit more exercise and the likes of... Now, it doesn't seem to matter to many people. I, I, I can't get my head into their head to look at themselves in a mirror and think, why don't they want to do something about it? I think also the problem is, is that we're not allowed to, to confront people with things anymore because you, you might offend them when you've got to be body positive. I've probably just done it. I've got a, a, a friend of mine, he's, he's a very, very large guy. He's, he's, he's kind of obese and, mm -hmm. and large and he's having some health, health issues. And not one of the doctors that he's gone to has said to him, you're fat, you need to lose weight. Really? Those, that language is not allowed to be used anymore, but why if it's going to save his life and help him get well? Well, in, in fact, you're just saying it. It'll help save his life and or other medical problems as he gets older. Mm -hmm. But then what worries me is that these younger people who aren't well, who are they going to look after? Who's going to look after you when you get a bit older? Who's going to look after me, a grandmother, when mm -hmm. I'm even older? Because about... they won't be well enough to look after us. What about, is there a, you know, your, your solution there about uh, moderation in all things from a nutritional point of view, but is there a simple solution to exercise and that kind of fitness? Because we're also bombarded, in the same way that we're bombarded with fad diets and all the information about nutrition and the rest, there's a million different ways to keep fit. There's, all, there's one fashion after another. What is your, what is your simple, you know, button-down mind approach to that, just keeping well? As, as far as I'm concerned, one needs to keep active. And mm -hmm. if you've got an active body, the chances are you've got an active brain as well. I mean, the simplest thing, go for a walk. Take the dog for a walk. And, do you know, the minute you go for a walk, you see somebody else, you go, hello, and before you know it, why, you've got a mental thing going why, on. Why do people go on treadmills in gyms? I can't... Why do they do what? Go on treadmills in gyms rather than go for a walk. How boring can that be? What's that? Do you do that? No, I, I swim. I think, swim. I think sometimes it's a time thing. People think, right, well, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to do this, this and this, yeah. and I'm going to get out. But you're completely right. The best way to stay well is to keep constantly active. Mm. Just move. Mm. Move more. And, and, and that in itself, which people stopped moving, they stopped walking places. Everyone gets buses and cabs and Ubers and whatever, and they don't walk enough. But I, this is what I feel. I was brought up in the country. I was I'm some Somerset born and bred, my dear. <laughs> and we didn't have parents to take us to school. We had our Wellington boots on and we walked over fields and up dark lanes and went to school. We were active, naturally active all the time. There wasn't an alternative and we didn't grumble because we didn't know anything different. But it's, it's so... Uh, it, it, it's, as though, it's as though it's something that we've taught ourselves, that we've educated ourselves out of. I mean, I, I read all the time about sitting being the new smoking, you know, that we've developed these sedentary lifestyles. And so many people, you sit, I, I do it too, I sit and write, mm. you know, and I sit looking at a screen and, I, and I've become aware that I've been sitting down sometimes for, you know, three and four hours at a Oh, well, stretch. then that's your first mistake. OK to sit down and get intrigued with something on the telly or some no, music. I'm, no, I'm talking about working. But talking get about... up every now and again. Yeah. What about a standing desk? And Is there any virtue in that? I've got a standing desk. And does it work for you? It certainly does. If I'm writing books, and I do write yes. books, um, and I'm there for ages and ages, moving from one foot to another, standing there with the computer at a good height, not down uh -huh. there somewhere, I find that wonderful, looking into the garden, talking to the cat, all Does that. it change your thought process? Does it change the way that yes, you Yes, it you does. Create? And the sun shines and suddenly 
the writing becomes a bit easier again than stuck there. Julie, it's ironic, isn't it, that we've developed so much about, we know so much, or there's so much information about diet and so much information about exercise, and yet we're all, eat, we're all eating the wrong things and we're not taking enough exercise. It's, exactly. it's counterintuitive. And I, I think also technology. People have Fitbits now. Have you noticed? <laughs> I go swimming and I notice people stand at the side for 10 minutes doing this and then they get out and you think, <laughs> well, you've just been looking at that and you haven't been swimming. Why not just get in the pool and swim or go to the walk and swim? You don't, you don't yeah. have to look at this telling you because you spend most of your time prodding it. The doing, you know. It feels like we've got too much information, too much knowledge, too many choices, and, yeah. and yeah. everyone's just kind of trapped in an, an uncertainty about what to do, so they just have something else to eat. And yeah. also that sort of uncomfortable and unpleasant having to do that. Why not just get out in the garden? Why not join a, 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 a football club or a tennis club or something? Be active with other people and get that enjoyment, not sort of, oh, I've got to do this mm. jog and, you know, how's my pulse rate? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Diana Moran, it's been absolutely lovely to meet you in person. And I also, what I love most of all is common sense and you radiate above all else, <laughs> absolute common sense about all of the subjects that you're interested in and that I'm interested in. I well. do have a website of common sense. It's called keepfitandcarryon.com. Excellent. Common sense. Everyone go there. That's all from me on Neil Oliver Live <laughs> tonight. My thanks as always to my brilliant panel, Julie Cook and Tonya Buxton. And to Diana Moran, Green Thank Goddess, you. always. Next up, it's the brilliant Mark Dolan tonight. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. Looking ahead to tomorrow's weather, and there will be a mixture of bright or sunny spells, scattered heavy showers, and strong winds across the UK. Let's take a look at the details. A windy morning for northern Scotland with gales in the west, scattered showers to the north and west, with drier conditions and sunnier skies to the east, highs of 7 Celsius. For Northern Ireland, a dry but windy morning with sunny spells, but showers arriving from the west later in the day. Afternoon highs of around 6 Celsius. Northern England will likely turn increasingly showery through Sunday morning with a fresh southwesterly breeze and temperatures climbing towards afternoon highs of 7 Celsius. It will be an inclement day for North Wales with the showers merging into